Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And I hope you enjoy this new show, whether you're viewing it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the episode. I do want to thank you for being part of my audience. You can also find links to videos or podcasts on MiamiGhostChronicles.com as well as where you can submit your story about any eerie experiences you've had, which I would love to hear about. Just go to the Submit Your Story tab. Please subscribe to our channel so that you receive notification of when we release a new show. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where I usually live stream and where I give you a behind the scenes look at locations where new episodes are being filmed at. I also tell you about all the interesting guests that will be appearing soon on Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you enjoy the show and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles. How is everyone doing today? Good, I hope. Let me tell you. I got to I got to talk about this real quick. Usually I'm doing great. But you know where I live, I depend I've got a well on my house. That's how I get my water and for some reason a couple of days ago after a power outage, my well decided not to work again after my power came back. I'm telling you it's been like what the longest 72 hours. <laughs> There's nothing like having no water in your house to like go oh, I'm such a cry baby I admit it I am a cry baby but anyway guys let me get to the really important stuff which is the fantastic guest that I have today and this is a gentleman by the name of Mark Spencer and uh, he is the author of the nonfiction novel A Haunted Love Story and also the novels Ghost Walking, The Masked Demon, The Weird Motel and Love and Reruns in Adams County Okay, he also has collections of short stories, uh, and he has over a hundred uh, novellas, short stories, and articles that have appeared in national and international uh, magazines. He's received numerous uh, prizes and awards recognizing his work, and he, uh, you might have maybe even seen him probably on TV because he's appeared on some of the paranormal shows talking about a very interesting and tragic story about where he lives which is a certain house in Monticello but anyway let me bring Mark on and we can talk about that a little bit more but anyway how are you doing today Mark oh I'm fine fantastic I am so glad to have you on it's a pleasure for me and I'm gonna ask you Mark what I ask all my guests which is prior to you moving into this house where you had these these um, paranormal uh, encounters or experiences. Did you ever have a brush with the paranormal prior to this? Uh, no, um, it's a pretty pretty easy question for me to answer. Um, before moving into the Allen House in Monticello, Arkansas, I was a, a pure skeptic. I I thought people who talked about ghosts and other paranormal um, activities were or people who had active imaginations. So, okay. Uh, um, I, I, I didn't believe any of it. When my wife and I first moved to, to Monticello and, and we told new friends and acquaintances that we were interested in the, the big old house or North Main Street, they would frequently tell us that we didn't want to buy the house because it was haunted. And we would just laugh because right. we thought it was really funny that these people took the idea of a haunted house so seriously. Right. In, a, in other words, that it was like you were thinking, okay, fine. That I, I imagine if it's going to get me a better price in the house, better so. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, so obviously you, you bought the house mm -hmm. and you move in. And I mean, I live myself in a hundred year old house. It's an old wooden farmhouse. And I know that sometimes these houses, they make these unusual noises that just, just comes with the territory of having an older home. Oh, sure. um, did that happen to you guys? And at what point did you start realizing that it, maybe it just wasn't coincidental? Um, 
Well, of course, you know, there are, there are lots of stories about the house. The house was already pretty well known before mm-hmm. my wife and I ever heard about Monticello, Arkansas, or the Allen House. Right. Uh, there had been write-ups in magazines and in newspapers, and there had been chapters in books going back 40 or 50 years, wow. as a matter of fact. Um, since the 1950s, the Allen House had had a reputation for paranormal activity. And, uh, and and I had grown up in a, an old house. I grew up in a house built during the Civil War, in fact. Okay. And so I knew that old houses made um, made noises, and and sometimes there were funny smells, and mm-hmm. and sometimes the odd shapes of the rooms and the and the windows could create interesting things in terms of light and shadow. So I was uh, I was aware that there were a lot of natural explanations for what people interpreted as paranormal, and so I was pretty good at just rationalizing things. Okay. And... Uh, my my <laughs> wife and I moved into the house, uh, and and I actually right away some some unusual things started happening. Um, but I was pretty pretty good at rationalizing. Okay, right. Things. In other words, yeah, you're like thinking. And I imagine, and people don't realize sometimes that when you're moving into a place, sometimes you're so caught up in the process of moving and mm-hmm. that you, you almost you don't have time to pay attention or to really think about what it is that you're either hearing. And let me ask you, um, prior to you owning the house, I mean, had it stood vacant, or did you buy it directly from somebody that was living in it? We bought it from a somewhat eccentric woman who was living there by herself. Okay. Um, we uh, we moved to town, and we just fell in love with the house. We just thought it was a, a, a beautiful Victorian, mm-hmm. um, needed some work. Uh, we The house was not for sale. Oh, okay. But we, but we did tell new friends and acquaintances around town that that we love that house and that we were interested in buying it if the person who owned it would ever be interested in selling it okay. we had actually gone to see a real estate agent about the house okay. uh, we wanted the real estate agent to approach the owner and see whether she would be interested in wow and looking at an offer and the real estate agent wouldn't do it Really? Uh, and she was very vague about her reasons for, for not um, approaching the owner. She she merely told us that the house had a history, and she wanted to have... That's <laughs> unusual, because so usually real estate agents, if there's a way for them to make a commission, it's like, okay, what's the worst that can well, happen? They say no, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I told my wife, I said, well, I guess we moved to a town where real estate agents have no interest in, <laughs> exactly. in making money. <laughs> no ambition. What's wrong? <laughs> yeah. So we just, so we left the realtor's office and decided that uh, we would maybe just approach the owner ourselves. And, and we okay. we did go to the house, but, but nobody was there. Um, the, the woman we bought the house from was frequently gone on trips. She traveled a lot. Okay. But, you know, it's a small town. Word mm-hmm. gets around. And one day um, she called me at my office at the university okay. and said, I understand you want to buy my house. And I said, wow. well, would you be, you know, would you consider selling your house? And she said, I might if I like you. And, oh my God. <laughs> and then we, we arranged to, to see the the inside of the house. Um, she she was about to leave on another trip, and so it was going to be about three weeks before we could get to see it. In the meantime, my wife and our kids um, got into the habit of driving by the house a lot. Okay. And and one incident um, that that occurred that was kind of interesting. This was a couple of days before we actually got to see the inside of the house. We we all pulled up in in front of the house in a car and. And one of the kids in the back seat said, "Look, there's a lady in that window up there." Are and and I look and and I see this lady and and, and it looks like a a woman sitting at a desk, maybe reading or writing a letter. Um, and and we all saw her. My wife saw her. All three kids 
saw her, and my wife even said, you know, we probably shouldn't sit here like this. She'll think we're right, she's got to think what's her. wrong with him. <laughs> Why are they looking at me? Yeah, oh my and so God. we and so we drove away. You know, no no doubt that that we had had seen the owner sitting in the window. But then a couple of nights later, when my wife and I got to see the inside of the house, she took us up to the second floor and she opened the the door of the room where the window was. Um, it happened to be the master bedroom suite, as uh-huh. a matter of fact, and. And we couldn't enter the room because it was full of boxes and furniture. The owner was using the room for storage, and she apologized that we couldn't get inside the room. And I said, but we saw you in the window the other night. And she said, no, no, that wasn't me. (laughs) Okay. Now, let me – and at that point, she didn't fess up to anything. She was – all she was saying was, it wasn't me. So it's like, make of it what you will, (laughs) but it wasn't me. I, you know, and and I was a little bit insistent for for very briefly. I said, but but we all saw somebody in the window, and she right. said, I wasn't even home. I wasn't even home the other night, and and nobody else lives here. And as you can see, you can't even get to that window. And right. I said, oh okay. And I I just I would I I just let it go. I I dropped it. Right, because you're thinking, I want her to like me, so she'll sell this house. (laughs) Right. I'm trying to ingratiate myself with this lady because I I want her to sell me her house. Um, So I I wasn't going to say anything more about it. And then she said, have people been telling you that the house is haunted? And I said, yeah, I've been hearing those stories. (laughs) Um, I I said dismissively. Right. Let me ask you, did 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 she ever confide to you? Or what did she think well, that's going to well, kill yeah. my sale? No, actually, actually, as soon as I said um, that, yeah, I, I, I've been hearing or we'd been hearing um, from from several people in town that the house was haunted, you know. But I let her know that, you know, I didn't I didn't take it seriously. Then she immediately said, oh, but it is haunted. Oh, OK. <laughs> so she and was then, truthful. <laughs> yeah. And then she proceeded to tell me and my wife about some of her own personal experiences in the house, especially when she first moved in. She said that when she first moved into the house, the spirits talked to her a lot, and and it really bothered her, and she wanted them to shut up. (laughs) And and so she she performed some rituals with holy water. Right. Um, And I'm thinking, this lady's nuts. (laughs) Right, and you're like, okay. (laughs) But I'm not saying that. I'm being like, oh, really? Of course, you're like, okay, just... (laughs) Oh, okay. Well, that's really interesting. That's fascinating. Um, and, and she said that she um, she got them to quiet down and that they, they didn't talk too much anymore. You know <laughs> you what? Know but it's, you have to give it to her. She didn't chase her out. She didn't. She like, I don't know. How, how long did she live there for, for a while? She was there about nine or ten years. That's pretty long. That's that's decent. She just they yeah. stood, stood her ground, I guess. It was like, shut up. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. She wasn't afraid of the of the spirit. She mm-hmm. she just was found them kind of annoying when they started talking to her. <laughs> it's like okay. it's very pragmatic about it. It's like okay, well, this is my house, and I'm living here now, so be quiet. Right. Um, and, and anyway, it was a long, drawn-out process um, in terms of buying the house. It was almost two years before we actually got to move into the house. Two years. Oh yeah. Well, we we kept having closings because she, we we did come to a price, and she actually didn't want a whole lot of money for the house. Um, okay. Not nearly as much as I thought she would want. And so we signed a contract, and I gave her earnest money, and um, and then we were going to close, and and she canceled the closing, and then she kept canceling the close, and she probably cl- canceled nine or ten closing dates. Wow. Um, she always had one excuse or another. She wasn't finished packing or she didn't feel well. And what it was was she was having a really difficult time letting go of the house. That's what I was about to say. That sounds like there's, there's something else like going on with her as far as her attachment to that house. Yeah. When we finally did move into the house, she she couldn't leave town. She had these. She had four moving vans <laughs> full of her stuff. Wow. Because she had a lot of stuff. It's a big house, and she had a lot of stuff. Um, and she had those four moving vans parked in the the lot of a motel just on the edge of town, and she stayed in that motel for three weeks because she couldn't leave town. 
And then she that started telling people that we had stolen the really house from unusual. her. <laughs> you know what? Because, and what, was she was moving out of the town? Is that it? As far as where she was going to? Yeah, she was moving to the um, Gulf Coast of Texas. Okay, yeah. See, most people, when they're moving, they're like, they hit the road. It's like, I'm out of here. Bye. Whatever. I, I got stuff to do. Yeah, yeah, there was something going on there. <laughs> yeah, she just, well, as I said at the beginning, she was rather eccentric. And uh, she, okay. for one thing, she was a hoarder. I was um, about to, you just took the words right out of my mouth. I said, you know what? That's a lot of stuff because, you know, when people move, yeah. you either leave or go, you know, you get rid of stuff because you finally go through your stuff and you get rid of your junk. But that's a lot of stuff that she was, yeah, that's a hoarding thing, yeah. So, yeah, when she wasn't when she wasn't traveling and buying things, mm -hmm. she was sitting in a home watching the shopping channel, and that's oh how she spent God. her time. She didn't have a job. She would she just lived off her. I don't know. She she had money from a couple of ex husbands, and and she just watched the shopping channel when she was at home and, and ordered things. I imagine three quarters Every, of that stuff in those trucks was unopened, probably. <laughs> Well, there was a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of unopened boxes. Mm -hmm. And she was a rich hoarder. She had money, so she had nice right. things. <laughs> she uh, wasn't going through trash cans, in other words. <laughs> no, it, it, it's not like, you know, these people you see here on TV, they have mm -hmm. 30,000 empty milk cartons piled up in yeah. their living room. She had nice um, furniture, nice paintings, prints, art prints, mirrors, knickknacks. But, but the shopping were, were channel, stacked. when she called in, they were like, here she is again. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. And she had stuff stacked floor to ceiling. Wow. We really didn't have a good idea of the condition of the interior of the house until she finally moved out. Well, you know what? I was about to ask you that when I know, like you said, that you got to go inside and then, of course, you had all these delays with, with your closing. But it sounds mm -hmm. like if you know if you go into a room and it's stacked with stuff, like how could you really find out? What's there, what's not there, if there's anything wrong. It was like, so I bet you got a few surprises then after you moved in, huh? Yeah, the house wasn't in nearly as good a shape inside yeah. as we thought it was. It looked, it didn't look too bad because, as I said, she had nice things. She just had an overabundance of them. Right. And so she had lots of, of expensive, glittery objects. And, and the walls were just totally covered with art prints and, and paintings and mirrors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we really couldn't see what the walls looked like right. after she moved out we realized that the house was going to be a lot more work than we had thought so in other words you're telling me you had like you know that like that movie from the 80s the money pit where oh, yeah. after the old owner moves away you're like oh <laughs> and that's the thing that that um i imagine you know there's only i, I mean even as handy as you are sometimes you got to invest money to have people to come in to do work for you in some of these houses to you know oh yeah to live there yeah about about 10 days after we moved in my wife's sister and brother-in-law came to visit and the first thing her brother-in-law said when he walked into the house was how long was this place abandoned oh my god so that gives you an idea of what it looked like right yeah once all the glittery stuff was gone <laughs> yeah once all the glittery stuff was gone it looked pretty rough but we 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 worked to to get it fixed up. It it was it was a lot of work, but so it, you finally had your. Okay. You guys, let me tell you something. Hats off, you guys. You really stuck to it. I mean, as far as mm -hmm. getting what you wanted, a lot of people, I imagine, would have thrown up their hands and said, "That's it. I'm done with this lady in the house. Forget it. I want it." But so yeah. it was meant to be. In other words, I guess is my point. Right. But after we we finally got to move in, the first few days we were in the house some strange things happened. The, um, you want to hear about those? Oh, yes. Yeah, the, um, the day we were actually moving in, um, I was carrying boxes through the, the side door, and my son, who was five years old at the time, was standing by um, the back staircase, what they used to call a servant staircase. Mm -hmm. And he was just standing there, and I, I'm carrying these boxes. I'm trying to juggle these boxes. And and I noticed him just standing there, and he, and he looked a little bit pale. And I and I thought I was I kind of wondered whether he 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 was feeling bad. And and I walk in, and I turn my back to him, and I'm getting these boxes situation situ situated. And I say over my shoulder to him, "Well, how do you like your new house?" And he doesn't answer me. And I get the boxes set, 
And then I turn, and he and he's not there. He's gone. And I thought, oh, that's strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, he just disappeared, and he never said anything. And then uh, about well, 20 or 30 minutes later, I went upstairs, and I found him watching a Star Wars movie. And I said, well, you, you okay? You didn't say anything when you're standing by the staircase downstairs. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, about, you know, just a few minutes ago, uh, you are standing by the side staircase. And, and I asked you how you liked the house, and you didn't, you didn't answer. Oh. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about, Dad. <laughs> you know? Oh, my and, God, and that's said, incredible. Yeah, and I said, oh, okay. Um, you know, not, not going to think about it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah it. I, 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 I got to move stuff into the house, but I'll put that on the back shelf of, like, WTF. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> and, then, and then a couple of days later, um, my my little boy and I are in the kitchen. And we'd been in the kitchen for about a half hour that morning, and my wife comes in, and she looks at her son and she says, how did you get down here so fast? And he you know, just looks at her confused. And I said, well, you know, Jacob's been down here with me for half an hour. And she said, no, I just saw him upstairs in the hallway. I said, no, he's been right here with me. <laughs> right, so you were vouching <laughs> and, for him. Yeah, and then, she's, and, and then she, she kind of gasped and said, oh, my God. <laughs> You know, and then she she proceeded to tell me about an incident that had happened the day before. She had been in the the front entrance of the house and the in the front hallway um, unpacking some boxes, and she said she'd seen Jacob go into the the bathroom just off the entrance, um, close the door, and and she had kept working there in the entrance with the boxes, and he'd never come out. And so finally, she went to the door, she knocked on, and they didn't get an answer, and she opened the door, and he wasn't in there. Oh. And so she she's thinking, well, he just, you know, came out when she had her back turned, <laughs> and she didn't see him. So she she went looking for him, found him upstairs in his room, and asked him whether he was feeling okay, you know, and he said, well, why? And, so, and she said, well, because you were in the bathroom a long time. And he said, oh, I wasn't in that bathroom downstairs. I don't go in that bathroom downstairs. It's too creepy. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, let me ask you, this was, this is the, you only had, what, one child at that time, or was it the same child? No, that... it, no we had a um, couple of boys and a daughter. Okay. But, but all the incidents I'm describing occurred with the the one son. The one son. Okay. Okay. All right. Time. So. Oh boy. And um, and and then something similar happened with my wife. Um, she she had a friend come over, and my wife opened the the front door as soon as her friend um, came up. And and her friend said, how did you get down here so fast? And my wife said, well, I was already down here. And the friend said, well, no, I just saw you upstairs in that window. Oh, God, <laughs> the window. Said, said, no, I've, I've been down here for a while. And, and, and then the same friend was helping my wife a couple of weeks later um, prepare for a, a yard sale because the woman we bought the house from left all kinds of junk. Uh-huh, <laughs> I bet. And so we decided, okay, we're going to have a yard sale. We're going to try to try to sell all this stuff. And my wife was in the back of the house tagging items, and her friend was carrying things into the front of the house. And my wife said she, she heard her friend talking to somebody. She was wondering who her friend was talking to because she wasn't aware that anybody else was in the house. But finally, the friend came to the back of the house and said, well, well there you are again. Why didn't you come and help me? And my wife said, well, what are you talking about? And the friend said, well, you kept just standing there in the library staring, and I, and I asked you to come and help me. And my wife said, I haven't been standing in the library. I've been back here the whole time. So whatever it is is like, oh, my God, that's incredible. Well, it was a year before we had anything to do with paranormal investigators. Uh, we, we were bombarded with requests from paranormal investigators when we first moved into the house. The uh -huh. first day we were in the house, we were getting emails and phone calls from people who wanted to come and do investigations. And we just said, no, no, no. We're, we just bought this house as our private residence. We're, right, we're going to exactly. fix it up and live here. We're, we're not really interested. And, you know, we, we, we don't have time to fool with paranormal investigations. Um, 
but but a year later, we did let the first paranormal group come in, and we told them about these incidents that occurred when we first moved into the house, and and they told us that the incidents sounded like doppelganger activity. Yeah. Where uh, the you know a spirit is pulling energy from a living person in the house, mm-hmm. and and takes on the appearance or a very similar appearance to that right. living person they're pulling energy from, which you know and there's a certain kind of logic to that, but mm-hmm. you know I, I can I can accept, but um, but but yeah there were there were various incidents over the fir- course of the first year we were in the house. My wife says she heard things. Um, of course, my wife was at home every day, all day, and, right. and you know, spend a lot more time there. And she said she'd hear these voices, and she, and then on a couple of occasions, she she saw things. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, my poor wife. Yeah. You know, right. You know, I know that usually she's at home. She's home alone too well, much. And you and you know what? I'm glad you brought that up, Mark, because you know everybody always thinks that all these hauntings and all these things always only happen like at 3 a.m. And that really, sometimes you get all the full thing in the middle of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I I was um, at home sitting in in our bedroom there reading one afternoon. It was Sunday afternoon, middle of the afternoon, and my wife came into the room looking a little pale. (laughs) And and she said, "There's, there's a man out in the hall. And I said, Oh really? There's a man out in the hall. <laughs> yeah, like how did he get there? As in, like a real life <laughs> yeah. person. Yeah. And I said, well, well, who is it? And him, my wife said, I think it's Joe Lee Allen. And I said, Joe Lee Allen, the man who had the house built in 1906. <laughs> 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 he said, yes. <laughs> wow. I said, oh, okay, and 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 I'm still a skeptic. Okay, I'm, I'm right. still not not really believe in any of this, and I'm I'm thinking, yeah, there's a rational explanation for this. There are toxic fumes coming up from the right. ground <laughs> below <laughs> beneath this house, or something, or or there's something wrong with the electrical system. Yeah, something's going on, you know, to make my wife crazy. <laughs> you know, right, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, we were approached by Louisiana spirits. Um, in the late spring of 2008, we've been in the house almost a year, and they seemed like really down to earth, reasonable, scientific oriented paranormal investigators. Okay. They they told us that they were mainly into debunking okay. stories of haunting, and uh, 98% of the investigations they did, they could find no evidence of anything. And in the 2% of cases, when they did find something, it wasn't really evidence of paranormal activity was blamed. Okay. And and so we agreed to let them come in. They said they put no stock in subjective experiences. It was all as objective as possible. They they used the technology available to, to try to discern things. And they really did try to explain why people might be thinking they were having paranormal experiences. And I thought this sounded pretty interesting, you know, okay. and I thought, okay, we'll let them have a do their paranormal investigation and maybe they'll come up with some explanations. I honestly at that point still didn't think they would find any evidence of paranormal activity whatsoever. I thought they might find right, some but you're thinking, but they're so. going to be trying really hard to debunk this, which is great. And it... Yeah, and so they they showed up. I think it was in early June, maybe of 2008, and they had all this equipment, and they 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 set up. And my wife and I don't know the protocol for having a paranormal investigation mm-hmm. in our house, and so we decided, well, we're going to go out to dinner, and then we're going to go to a movie, and we're going to let them have the house to themselves. And so we we're leaving the house, and I say, um, okay, we're leaving. The house is all yours. <laughs> and I remember. <laughs> feeling a kind of electrical charge in the air when I said that. Um, and, and I really didn't think too much about it at the time, but I but I did feel something. Okay. I had a sense of something as we were leaving. And we get in the car and we drive down the street. We're only a couple of blocks from the house and my 
why cell phone rings, and it's the lead investigator saying that all the power has just gone out in the house. Wow. And, and so we turn around, we go back to the house, and the place is dark. <laughs> and, You're like, what? <laughs> and, and we find out that they were just about to begin their investigation. Yeah. The lead investigator was literally in the process of saying, let's begin when uh -huh. a tree limb in the backyard broke off the tree and fell on the main power line and ripped the meter off the house. <laughs> you know what? You could say... I'm telling you, I call that paranormal sabotage because, yeah, you could say, yeah, I mean, nothing's impossible. Let's, you know, mm -hmm. nothing is. But that time is pretty incredible. Yeah, well, and it was, and it was a warm early summer night. It, it wasn't raining. The wind wasn't uh -huh. blowing. The tree wasn't dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a it's like tree. And and and. And in addition to the, the limb falling, just as they were about to begin, one of the members of the investigative team got a text. And this was back in the early days of texting. And, mm -hmm. and it came from an unknown number. And the text was, I'm watching you. Oh, God. And she thought it was some guy back in Texas who was stalking her or something. I was about she, to say, you know, that's like that she, movie, The Stranger has the house. We're getting the phone call, but it's from the inside of the house. It's like, what? Yeah, but it, it happened at the same time that the tree limb fell. That seemed... And, and so the investigators, they weren't able to do their investigation that night. They did have some battery-operated um, digital audio recorders run in, but, you know, it took hours and hours to get the electric company to come out and Let put me ask the meter back Mark, in the when, house. When all this happened, did did they think that it was paranormal, or were they just poo-pooing it as, no, no it's just they, coincidentally bad timing? They thought it was a coincidence. I thought it was a coincidence. I thought okay. it was great, though. I said, wow, we have a story to tell because it's a great coincidence. Uh, I, didn't, okay. I, I didn't say to myself, oh, this is evidence of paranormal activity. Right. I was saying, wow, this is a great coincidence. It's a story. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. I'm a writer, you know. I, I've been writing short stories and novels for years, so you know, I, I, I appreciate mean, a good story. <laughs> that's it. Let <laughs> me tell you that that's incredible manipulation. Though, I'm sure when you think of it, because like you said, one of the things that sounds like they were is that they had a million gadgets, which were, if not battery operated, were dependent mm -hmm. on electricity. Yeah. Well, a couple of days after the aborted attempt at a paranormal investigation, um, one of the investigators called me and he said, well, we got something. And I said, well, you got something? And he said, yeah, we, we got a couple of EVPs on the, on the battery operated audio recorders. Um, the, the, the one EVP that was really compelling was captured on a recorder up in the hallway where they had their, their, their main station set up. And it was recorded right after the electricity went off, right after the tree limbs. Okay. You can hear the investigators talking, and, um, and and you hear one of the investigators actually saying, that's a weird coincidence. <laughs> you <know>? Okay. <laughs> and yeah. you hear an investigator say, well, I think a transformer blew. And then you hear this woman's voice, and it's not one of the investigators, it's a of a distinctly different quality uh -huh. it's kind of whispery and she says not a transformer <gasps> and then she repeats that oh. phrase two times not a transformer so she she says not a transformer a total of three times and that's the whole evp <laughs> let me tell you something though. that talk about an intelligent response yeah well, sometimes you and, hear about these evps that you're like First of all, it's like, you know, certain words that uh, try to fit them into, you know, like, but that's, oh, boy. Yeah. Well, and, and my reaction was, well, that's really interesting. I wonder how they fake that. Because <laughs> <laughs> <It's laughs> I'm, still, I'm still skeptical. I'm thinking, well, they, some, one of the investigators must have said that. You know, you know I'm, I'm still not ready to, to buy into it. But they did want to come back and do a full investigation. And so they came back about three weeks later, and, and my wife said she wasn't going to leave the house. She didn't want anything else broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't blame her. And I said, okay. So we stayed, and, we, and, and, and nothing, you know, nothing bad happened. No more tree limbs fell. And they were able to conduct their full investigation. And, and it was really interesting for, for me and my wife to, 
to um, kind of follow the investigators around and sit in on their EVP sessions and, and sit with them while they watched monitors and, and, and did all the usual paranormal investigative activities. And then a couple of weeks after that, um, they came back to the house for the reveal. Okay. And the lead investigator, we all sat down in the dining room, and he had his laptop, and he opened up his laptop, and, and he said, before I, I show you anything, <laughs> you know, do you want to ask me what, what homeowners always want to ask? And I said, well, I guess, what, what do they always ask? And he, and he said, well, they always want to ask the question, is my house haunted? Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, so is my house haunted? And he said, yes, definitely. <laughs> In other words, okay. That's incredible coming and, from a group that you're telling me was to always try to debunk stuff. Right. And then he proceeded to play for uh, over 40 EVPs. What? They had recorded. He said it was unprecedented. He said they had oh never heard of any group recording so much activity. They also had a couple of videos. And, you know, they didn't, they didn't have videos of any full-bodied apparitions or anything like that, but they had some funky looking things on video a couple of video clips but that but the voices were really compelling um over 20 of the 40 were what they called category a evp right these were right. very distinct um more than a single word and there are different voices it wasn't just the same voice uh -huh. um there were at least five or six different voices um the evps were dominated by the voice of an adult woman, okay. uh, and and then there was a voice of what sounded like an older woman, maybe an elderly woman. Um, there were a few of what sounded like an older man, and there were several of what sounded like a young man. Um, and then there were a couple of children's voices, and and all the paranormal investigations that we've had since that first one. Um, we they've all recorded EVPs of the same voices. That is incredible. So, so it's almost like, yeah, they're still it's there. It's a family. It's... And, and my wife and I now, we recognize the voices. We have, you know, investigators will come in and go, oh, oh I got this EVP. Let me play it for you. And I'll say, oh, yeah, that's Joe Lee. Or, no, that, that's Caddy. <laughs> so, know, Mark, that's, let me ask Liddell. you something. <laughs> yeah. After they play these EVPs for you, were you starting to become kind of a believer, or were you still holding out for? I was getting, I was getting <laughs> okay. very close. Right. <laughs> I was getting very, very close. Okay. Um, I remember sitting in my dining room with chills running up and down my spine, <laughs> yeah, okay. and I said, "Well, well, well, where do these voices come from? Who are these people? <laughs> Is that these right. people are ghosts?" <laughs> yes. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, there was still that little corner of my brain, though, telling right. me this couldn't be. You know, I, I couldn't figure out why they would be giving them money. They weren't giving me money. There wasn't. I, I didn't understand what the motivation would have been mm -hmm. for them to to fake these EVPs. But I still wasn't entirely convinced. And so um, probably a couple weeks after that, I decided I was going to do my own EVP session. Okay. And I went up to the attic by myself one okay. evening with a little like, $10 digital audio recorder. Uh -huh. and, and I sat up there in the attic and I asked a few questions of Liddell, who's the, the main spirit. She's the one who dominates EVP. So right. And she's the woman who, who committed suicide in the house. And, right. Um, and and I, I just asked her a couple of questions and waited a few minutes. I wasn't very patient. Um, well, asked her whether she liked it here at the house. And, and then um, I, I stopped the recorder and I, and I played back what I had. And, and I heard myself, of course, asking the questions. And then very distinctly, Liddell answered my question. She wow. said, yes, I like it here. And it was clear as day. I mean, it was very clear you that know she what? wanted me to know that she was there and she was answering my question. And you know what? Considering, you know, because now you see that, like you said, they've got all these expensive equipment, by the way, recorders and this. And mm -hmm. when you're going to get it, you're going to get it even 
when you've got, like you said, like you, you were probably thinking, I'm going to invest the minimum amount of money in something I'm not even sure I believe in, but let's right. test the theory. Oh, yeah. We, we've had guests in the house record EVPs on their cell phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They that... don't have to have anything fancy. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have real paranormal activity, exactly. <laughs> you're, you're not going to have to invest much money. I can guarantee you that, at least not from my personal experience. Yeah. But that, that night in the attic, I'm there by myself. I, I knew I was by myself. <laughs> there certainly right. was a woman sitting next to me. <laughs> you know? Right, but exactly. But her voice was, was very distinct. It was clear that she was answering my question and wanted me to know that she was there. And that's the night I became a believer. I was 100% convinced. Up to that point, people in town would would say, hey, is that house of yours still haunted? And I would say, I would laugh and say, well, right. no. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. After, after that night, when people would ask me whether my house was still haunted, I would say, yep, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and I know it for sure it is. Yeah. And obviously because Liddell was the one that committed suicide, was she always the ghost that was belonged to that house or... Was there also sightings of another type of ghost besides her? Well, um, going back decades in, in the sightings, people, previous owners, tenants, when the house was, was um, apartments, would, would most frequently see a, a female figure. Okay. Um, and, and I'd say 70 to 75% of the EVPs are her voice. Okay. But if you go back and you read about the house um, as it was written about in the 1960s, okay. there was mention of Liddell's son, Alan Bonner. Um, and, and so going back to the, the first of the, of the ghost stories that were told about the house, mm -hmm. it was always believed that Liddell and her son both um, okay. haunted the house. Her her son died in 1944 at the age of 28. Right, okay. And the attic um, had been a special play area and study area for him. And so the stories were that he haunted primarily the attic. And and I think he actually haunts the whole house. <laughs> He's okay, all because over the place. what happened was after she commits suicide, her family continued to live in the house for a while after that? Or what happened? Well, for a short time, um, yeah, she um, she took mercury cyanide on Christmas night, 1948. Mm -hmm. um, her her mother, Caddy, was having her annual Christmas party, and so the house was full of guests. And Liddell mingled with the guests until late in the evening, when she took a plate of hors d'oeuvres and a glass of punch up to the master bedroom suite, and she used the punch and the hors d'oeuvres to mask the taste of mercury cyanide tablets. Wow. Um, why she did this because Liddell was, you know, had a reputation for being cheerful and much loved and she was the kind of person you'd go to if you needed cheering up. Okay. Ironically. I know, um, but, but by then her, her son had passed away, right? Right. Her, her son had died about five years before. It had been okay. almost five years. Um, okay. Since her, since her son's death. And, and some people, of course, speculated that her suicide was connected in some way to her son's death. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was always a little skeptical about that because of the gap in time. Right. Um, so. Um, yeah, because it was like, what, I five years or four years, something like that, right? Five years. It was only, yeah, he died in January of 44. Okay. So it was, it was. You know, four four years, eleven months. Okay. So that's that's a pretty good gap in time. Um, right. Like this was not like a fresh, you know, that she no. did it right after he had passed away. Right, and and she had led a pretty active life, and and she appeared to have dealt with her her son's death pretty well her sister her younger sister louie died the same year later in 1944 and oh. and her her sister louie um left a daughter a uh, martha jones and and liddell became a sort of surrogate mother to okay. martha 
Okay. And Martha became a surrogate child to Liddell, and they okay. were very they they became very close. Okay. And I think I think Martha's presence um, was a, was a comfort to Liddell. Exactly, as far as feeling needed and everything. Sure, that's very understandable. Mm-hmm. So and go on with the story because I know that some people. But as far as something happened that that prompted her it was. To commit well, suicide. well, yeah. Nobody, yeah, nobody knew. People had their theories. Um, mm-hmm. They, you know, about you know, all her, you know, she was divorced, you know, but her, but she'd been divorced for twenty years. Yeah, so I never put any stock in that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. That's um, like. Um, she she did have a soldier boyfriend during World War II, um, okay. an American soldier who was a a guard at the Italian prisoner of war camp here in Monticello. Okay. But he had, and, and when the war ended in 1945, he had left and that was the end of their wartime romance. Um, but again, there was that gap of time. It was a good mm-hmm. three and a half year gap of time. And so I thought, right. well, you know, three and a half years, is she going to kill herself over her soldier boyfriend? No. Yeah, no, that doesn't Three and a half sound... years later? Right. No, that um, doesn't sound like a... A good motivator. I mean, because that's a pretty drastic step. Yeah, so it, it was quite a mystery. Nobody really knew um, what her motivation for taking her own life was until one Saturday morning in August of 2009. I woke up and I immediately felt the compulsion to go to the attic. Okay. And I didn't understand the compulsion. I, I thought, well, did I just have a dream about the attic or something? Because right, I had this right. real strong compulsion to go to the attic. And it was like a voice in my head telling me that if I went to the attic, I was going to find something. And I resisted the compulsion because we had been living in the house for a couple of years by that mm-hmm. point. And I had scoured the attic and I found all sorts of fascinating little artifacts. But I really didn't think there was anything left in the attic for me to find. Okay. And it was, you know, it was a hot August morning, and yeah. I had other things to do. Um, so I, I went downstairs and had breakfast. But all through breakfast, it was like this voice nagging me, you know, you've got to go to the attic. Okay. <laughs> and so about a half hour after I'd been up that morning, I found myself going to the attic. <laughs> and I didn't and this is a big attic. This is what they call a grandmother's attic. It was a couple of thousand square feet. Wow. And I didn't wander around the attic at all. I walked directly over to the the edge of the south turret room. Okay. And I stood there looking down at a small three inch, two and a half inch opening in the floor. And they're in its old attic floor. There are lots of gaps in the floor, uh-huh. like places where things have been cut out, or, or places where the floor was just unfinished to begin with. You know, 1906. Right. And and I stood there looking down at that that narrow gap in the floor, wondering what I was doing. That's a really small opening. Let me tell you. I mean, as far as that, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. That's it. it it's big enough to get your hand in, you uh-huh. know, and you, know, you can stick your hand through it and, and reach into the attic floor. I, I looked down, you know, it was kind of off to the side of the entrance to the um, South Tort room, and I'd looked down, I'd looked at that opening probably several times in the couple of years we'd been in the house. I'd never seen anything inside the opening, never really gave a lot of thought to it. But as I'm standing there looking down at that opening, it was like that same voice saying, take a closer look. Oh. And I get down on my knees and I peer in and at first I still don't see anything. But as I keep looking, I finally get a glimpse of a brown piece of paper. And my first thought was that it was old butcher paper because it was that dark brown. Uh-huh. Um, and then right after that, I'm thinking, oh, it's old newspaper. It has to be old newspaper, you know, old newspaper that's turned brown like that. Right. So I'm I'm not thinking of anything interesting because there's lots of old newspaper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. You're just in. And, you know, under the floor and, and all. But but I reach in to this gap in the floor. I get a couple of fingers on, on the edge of this brown piece of paper, and I pull it out. And to my surprise, it wasn't an old newspaper. It was an envelope. It was an old brown envelope. 
Um, not a great big envelope, but a fairly large envelope. And I opened the flap, and inside were a bunch of smaller envelopes. And in these smaller white envelopes, all had three cent stamps on them and were postmarked. And they were addressed to Liddell Allen Bonner. And, um, and, and the dates on them were from October 1948. And okay. I opened, opened the flap or one of the white envelopes and I pulled out the letter and the salutation was dearest. And you're like, oh. And God. it was signed love. And then under the word love, was the initial P, just P, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this was a love letter okay. written to Liddell two months before she killed herself. Wow. And then I decided that I was probably dreaming and that it wasn't real. I was about to ask you, Mark, were you like <laughs> yeah. wigging out just about then going, okay, I just well, I was. found it's... the stash of letters out of this huge attic. I yeah, would have been like... It's... It's the only time in my life when I've been fully awake, but I really thought I had to be dreaming. Um, you know, wow. people always have dreams in which they they dream they're awake, and it's... they dream that they wake up, right, but they're exactly. still dreaming. Uh, this was the opposite of that experience. And so I I paused for, <laughs> for a few seconds, and then when I realized that this was really happening, that I was holding in my hand a love letter written to Liddell two months before her suicide, I I jumped up, I ran downstairs and got a claw hammer, I ran back onto the attic and I prayed up the floorboard. Okay. And there under the floorboard were eighty three letters from nineteen forty eight. Wow. Most of the letters, about sixty seven of the letters were from this guy named Prentice. The P. Okay. Um and 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 then there were other letters. There were letters from friends of Liddell's um, as well. And and then eventually, as I went through all the letters and the envelopes, I discovered a long, rough draft of a letter that Liddell herself had written, okay. and some scraps of of letters that Liddell had written. So she was keeping um, everything there. She okay. Mm, yeah, and the, the guy's name was Prentice Hemingway Savage. Okay. So you couldn't come up with a better name for a romance novel. Really? I was going <laughs> to say, yes. <laughs> and, and Prentice and Liddell had actually grown up together in Monticello. Uh, they had um, run in the same social circles. His father was a, a doctor, and, and she was the pampered, middle, pretty daughter of the town's wealthiest entrepreneur. Okay. And so, yeah, they... Uh, they and they had dated as teenagers and young adults. And in fact, in February of 1913, Prentice had had his last date in Monticello with Liddell on the front porch of the Allen house. And then she walked him to the train depot off the square and saw Texas where he began his career in the oil business. He eventually became vice president of Texaco Oil. Really? Fast forward 35 years, and Prentice in March of 1948 is, um, ironically, I always thought it was interesting, it was the 10th of March, I believe. It was the same day that Zelda Fitzgerald died in a fire at an insane asylum. Really? Um, yeah. And anyway... Prentice was in Monticello visiting his elderly mother and some old friends, and somebody asked him whether he would be interested in, in going up to Hot Springs to the horse races with a group of Monticellonians. And he said, well, sure, where, where are we going to meet to form a caravan to make this drive up to Hot Springs? And he was told the Allen House, and, and he was told that Liddell was back living at home with her mother, okay. and um, that if he came along, he'd... he'd get to see Liddell, whom he hadn't seen in 35 years. Okay. And, and he said, well, sure. And then he, um, and as he w walked up the um, walkway to the Allen house that day, he, he wondered whether Liddell would still be beautiful as she had been. 
right. Um, or whether she'd be old and wizened. Right. Well, yeah, because <laughs> what they hadn't seen each other, what, as teenagers? Or, I mean, it was all. Yeah, since she was 19. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> and, and, of course, to his delight, he discovered that she had not changed a bit. Okay. At least that's what he told her. <laughs> right. Um, that, that she was as beautiful as ever. And, and, of course, how do I know this? I know this because he wrote all about it in one of his letters. Wow. He he was very reflective and reminiscent in, in his letters and so the letters are really wonderful and that he you know, he, he writes about he his memories of of you know, growing up and his young adulthood and his memories of So he's like yeah, and he's connecting you know, her of Liddell. course to all these wonderful memories. Yeah, yeah. Um and and so on that day in March of 1948, he and Liddell and some other folks went up to Hot Springs, and he and Liddell shared a raccoon dinner at the Horse Track Restaurant. And some of those sparks of their youthful romance were, uh -huh. were still warm, apparently. And when he got back home the next Saturday um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Okay. He went into his secretary's office, and he used his secretary's typewriter. He, he'd like to type his letters, which is really great because his handwriting is really awful. So, so most you don't of have the to decipher handwriting. Type written. Yeah. Uh, he, he typed Liddell a letter telling her how much he enjoyed seeing her again after all the years and um, how, how, just what a wonderful you know, reunion it was for him. And she wrote him back right away, and thus began their correspondence. And very quickly, they're flirting with each other in the letters, oh, and very quickly, they're they're making plans to to see each other, to okay. meet up somewhere. Because he's a he's a an oil executive. He travels a lot. Right. She's the daughter of a of a wealthy entrepreneur. She travels a lot to go shopping. <laughs> Right, and so he has a perfect excuse to, to, to absent himself from home, I take it. Yeah, and so, and so they're talking about meeting up in St. Louis or Chicago or New York or Louisville. There are all sorts of places where they might meet up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that because they're old friends. So there's right. nothing wrong with old friends getting together. Yes, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, and, okay. And <laughs> I think it was in late... Well, late May or early June of 1948, um, Prentice mentioned that he was um, making a trip to Chicago, and Liddell said that she would join him there. And he got all excited. He um, he got the the nicest suite at the, at the nicest hotel in Chicago, right. um, and then she didn't show up. She couldn't make it. Oh my God! Um, and and it's not clear exactly what came up or why she couldn't make it. I have a feeling her mother <laughs> wanted to come along, right? And, of course, and and so she had to make excuses and and cancel the the yeah. trip. Uh, and and Princess was pretty pretty despondent about. Now let me ask you, Mark, how her, long has she been living up. with her parents? Was she after she got a divorce? She, was, she had been living there ever since, or she'd been there about eight years. Okay. She had, she had moved back home about 1940. Okay. And um, yeah. and, and in response to to his disappointment and and her disappointment too, Liddell was very mm -hmm. disappointed. She came up with a a scheme. To, to see him and spend some time with him in July of 1948. She had a friend named Mary, and Mary's mother lived in Stillwater, Minnesota. Okay. And Liddell decided that she wanted to meet Mary's mother. She had heard so much about Mary's mother. <laughs> she needed to meet Mary's mother. In person. <laughs> and so she decided she needed about a month to go meet Mary's mother. Right, it was like, so man... She, she took the train up to Minnesota, and and Prentice met her, and 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 Liddell did go visit Mary's mother one day, and Prentice went with her to meet Mary's mother, wow. as, as a matter of fact, because one of the letters was from Mary's mother. Okay. And, and, and Mary's mother said, well, bring your gentleman friend back again, <laughs> too, okay. you know. He was so charming, and it was so nice to meet him. And, so... um and so for about three weeks, 
Liddell and Prentice drove around Minnesota and Wisconsin and southern parts of Canada and his big Cadillac stopped at resorts and and tourist attractions and parks and by the time he dropped her off at the train station in Milwaukee or on his birthday in late July they were madly and passionately in love and totally committed to each other and promising to spend the rest of their lives together Liddell returned to Monticello probably happier than she had been her whole adult life Okay. She she had had this fairy tale kind of childhood, but then her adulthood had been rather disappointing. She had had this bad marriage to mm-hmm. a drinker and a womanizer, and 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 then you know she had the one son, and and her son had had died. Her sister had died. Right. Um, Liddell herself had had become an alcoholic, so she had a drinking problem, which she hid pretty well. So, but she was ready um, to be happy. It's like okay, and and she had had a lot of bad romantic relationships. Okay. She she was always getting involved with the wrong kinds of men. One of her friends wrote to her about that. <laughs> and, right. In other words, and, she was not fact, lucky in love, huh? No, she wasn't. And her friend Frances in New England said she was so glad that Liddell had finally met somebody with whom she was compatible. Okay. Uh, meaning Prentice, uh, be, because Francis had always been worried about the kinds of men Liddell got herself yeah. tied up with. Okay. You know, they, they, they just weren't right for her. Yeah, in other words, they were probably um, not trusting her judgment for a while. They were probably thinking, oh, God. Yeah, so um, so Liddell was really happy, and she wrote to these three friends of hers about this relationship. That's when she, can you know, revealed um, to to these three friends. It was after she got back from the north. Um, she she wrote to her friends, and and said, "I'm so happy. I'm in love," and, and that sort of thing. Right. The only problem, of course, was that Princess was married. I was about to say, I know there's got to be a fly in that ointment. And... Yeah. yeah. Now, to Princess's credit, as soon as he got back home to Minneapolis, he, after spending all this time with, with Liddell, um, he, he broached the subject of divorce. In fact, he got home late at night, and he, wow. he started talking with his wife immediately that night about wow. divorce and he wrote Liddell the next morning and said that he and his wife had stayed up all night and he had been working on convincing his wife that they should they should divorce that they hadn't been happy in, in a long time and that she hadn't said much of anything and he took that as acquiescence no oh, okay um <laughs> he was wrong of course yeah but but initially he thought that it was going to be easy. He was going to move to the club downtown, the gentleman's club, uh-huh. downtown within a week, and, and and he'd have a divorce within 10 business days because he and his wife didn't have any children, and, and you know, it was just going to be easy sailing, he thought. Okay. Well, it didn't work out that way. His wife had the opportunity, of course, to give some thought to the matter and to see an attorney. Yeah. And And she told Princess that she didn't want a divorce. She wanted a three-year trial separation. Oh, my God. And then at the end of three years, they would see about having a divorce. And if they did divorce, she wanted all the, all the property, all the real estate. She wanted all the stocks, all the bonds, all the cash, and all the cars. Wow. And Prentice said, well, what do I get? And she said, you get your freedom. I was about to say, oh, yeah. Yeah, Prentice, um, his wife's name was Helene, but he never spelled out her name in letters. He only referred to her as H wow. in the letters, which I think psychologically is interesting um, that he – he couldn't bear to spell out her name or something, right. or, or or maybe he thought that Liddell couldn't bear to see her name it's like, spelled out. But he he referred to his wife as H, and he and he never spelled out the word hell 
in his letters either. He always okay. used the letter H. And so he always, so when you read the letters, you have to what does pay close mean? attention to the context. Yes, to determine exactly. determine whether he's referring to his wife or to hell. And sometimes I mean, it's not easy to determine which it is. And it makes you wonder, I mean, okay, she was like, I'm going to make the price tag on this divorce so gigantic that you're mm. going to think twice about doing it. Right. And and so Princess had a tough time um, getting anywhere with the divorce. He he wrote to Liddell and he said, well, you know, every time I bring up the subject, we have to start from square one. And also, he's a busy man. He's a workaholic. Okay. He travels a lot. And when he's not traveling on business, he's going on hunting trips and fishing trips. Okay. And he's going to ball games. And Liddell's just going nuts, of course. <laughs> you know, I mean, she's sitting, like, I imagine, at home. the fishing trip? <laughs> You know, yeah, and, yeah, and get a divorce, uh, and and so they they have something of a of a row um, and in their correspondence in September, um, he suggests that maybe he could break away and come down to Memphis for a couple of days for a weekend, and they could meet up at a hotel, and and Liddell just explodes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not meeting you at any hotel. You know, what right. do you think yeah, because... I am? You know, and, and she said, Well I will I will come to see you and we will sit in the lobby for twenty minutes. And that is it. And he wrote her back and he said, I don't think so. I don't think you can do that to yourself, much less to me. <laughs> it's like okay. <laughs> Yeah, but she's not stupid. She's thinking, you know what? We just went from having an affair where you're talking about you're going to get a divorce from your wife, and now I'm seeing you're going to try to slip me into the role of mistress. Right. Kind of. In between the fishing yeah. and the hunting trips and your work. Yeah. But uh, but then she ended up giving in and saying, oh, well, yeah, I will come. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm being silly. I know you love me. and. But but then something came up and he couldn't come down. So actually, they never saw each other again after oh. July. Um, one of the things that they talked about in their correspondence was how they would be together on Christmas. Okay. They would be together. He would be free by the holidays, and he would come south, and he would be in Monticello. And so they would spend Christmas together. Well, as things turned out... Um, he wrote her a letter in early December telling her that he didn't think he was ever going to be able to leave his wife. He wow. might be able to leave her someday, but for right now, it didn't look like it. It right. was kind of ambiguous. And and by the way, he hadn't had time to pick up anything to send her for Christmas, so he thought he might send her some cash. Wow. So, you know, real romantic. Yeah, I was going to say that, that, that you could tell that romance is cooling a lot. And then... And then he went on in the, in the letter to complain about how he'd been to the dentist that week and how horrible that was. <laughs> um, and 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 he and he said, and I don't know whether I'll be able to write you any time in the New York City or in business. I'm gonna be really busy. Wow. And then there's silence. And and she wrote to her friends, her confidants, and each one of them wrote her back. And they didn't know how to comfort her. They were ill-equipped. Um, her one friend, Francis, in New England, merely said, I was afraid something like this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a friend of hers in Helena, Arkansas, who was actually Princess's half-sister, um, wrote to her and said, well, if things don't work out between you and Princess, I hope we can still be friends. Oh, not a lot of comfort okay. there. Like, I can see what's coming up on the horizon. Yeah, and then her her third confidant was a woman in Hot Springs, um, and and this woman was was kind of an odd woman. She was teaching Liddell about Christian Science. Liddell went to the Presbyterian Church, you know, put okay. her on a very conservative, conventional facade, but mm -hmm. was interested in all sorts of things like astrology and Christian Science. Um, of course, she couldn't tell anybody if she had these interests, but she she had them very profoundly. Right. And yes. um, and this woman Marie in Hot Springs, her response to Liddell saying, "I haven't heard from Prentice. I don't know what this last letter means. He 
kind of says he's not going to leave his wife, but he leaves it open that he will, just not right now. And and Marie wrote back and basically said, quit feeling sorry for yourself. Just have faith. And Merry Christmas and enclosed a Christmas card and and said, I hope I hope the new year is the best year of your life. Oh, wow. And that's the last letter of those 83 yes. letters. And that was just before Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Liddell um, went to the post office um, where she had a post office box. Um, again, as far as I know or anybody knows, again, there was no letter from Princess. Um, she often would take her mail to the pharmacy down the street and she would sit and she would drink coffee and read her letters and maybe write responses while she mm-hmm. sat there in the pharmacy drinking coffee. Or on Christmas Eve, she, she went to the pharmacy and she didn't sit and drink coffee. Um, she asked the pharmacist for um, mercury cyanide tablets, which oh, were sold wow. over the counter in 1948. It was a it was a common treatment for topical skin sores. Oh my! So she was already thinking along those lines, that premeditation part as to. Yeah. Yeah, and then the next night, her mother has her annual Christmas party. And I think Liddell was waiting to see whether Prentice would show up and surprise her. Because he had always said that he would be with her on Christmas. And then as Christmas Day ended and right. Prentice was nowhere to be seen, she decided to go ahead and take the drastic measure she had planned for her and went up to the master bedroom suite, which was her her bedroom, and and took the mercury cyanide. And when this occurred, I imagine the only ones that knew about her affair with the Prentice were the confidants. Her family had no idea what was going on. Not at the time. Apparently not. Um, you know, the, the, the confidants knew... Um, I've always wondered, I, I have talked to a, an elderly lady um, who was the daughter-in-law of the, the confidant in Helena, Arkansas. Okay. And, 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 and that woman died in 1966, the, the confidant died in mm-hmm. 1966. And this elderly lady who was her daughter-in-law said that her friend, um, you know, on several occasions, talked about Liddell Allen and and what a good friend Liddell had been. But in all the years that she knew um, the the confidant, who was also Princess's half sister, remember? Right. Uh, the the woman never let on that Liddell and her brother had had an affair. Wow. Well, she know how to keep and, her. Yeah, and, and of course there wasn't anything to be gained by revealing that. Right, I mean, it, exactly. it would only mean trouble for her brother. Right. So she, um, and he stayed married to her for the rest of his life. He lived I was about to say, he never ever got years. divorced from her, right? No, he never got divorced from his wife. There was, I, I, I really think that he, he saw no reason to divorce his wife after Liddell killed herself. He was a practical man. There was no wow. reason for him to divorce his wife after she know, uh, killed herself. But let me tell you something, though. She was pretty savage there, or she really knew him really well and said, mm-hmm. you know what, all I have to say is I want to take the f- all your money, which is what you used to go and go to your hunting and all these fishing trips, and, mm-hmm. and then what? Maybe yeah. she knew him pretty well. That's uh, yeah. but, but still, that's kind of like I'm going to blackmail you into staying married. Oh. And I know back yeah. then, I believe also you, when people got divorced, you know, you could, um, what was it, that you named an, a person as a, mm-hmm. basically as a defendant? Oh, well, Prentice, Prentice was terrified of scandal. Ah, there we go. They're, they're, you know, this is 1948. Yes. He's a prominent citizen. Um, this is the Midwest, Minnesota, and of course, Liddell's in the Deep South. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so these... This would have been front page news at that time. Yes. 
for it to be revealed that he had had an affair. And so Prentice was very concerned about his wife or anybody finding mm-hmm. out about the affair. And right. so there wasn't any possible way that he was going to tell his wife that, well, I've met somebody else, I'm in love with this woman, and I want to leave you so I could be with her. That wasn't going to happen. Right. Yeah. I'm sure she probably threw in there. Maybe he didn't put in his letter. Besides, see, I'm going to take your money. It was like, oh, and by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure to create a big scandal and name this lady, whoever she is, as, uh, as a defendant, and mm-hmm. I'm going to ruin everybody's reputation except yeah. mine because I'll be the martyr because you're divorcing me for another woman. Yeah. So. Yeah. Something, something clearly happened over Thanksgiving in 1948 okay. because Princess's letters, the few that he wrote after Thanksgiving are very morose, very dark. Okay. Um, so something she, his wife said something <laughs> over there over the Thanksgiving holiday. Yeah. Yep. That really spooked him. Yep. I that bet. really got him got him scared. Yeah, probably she had like you said, she probably got around to actually talking to an attorney and told him, Oh, by the way <laughs> mm-hmm. This is the outcome. So and Mark, so here she is, she commits suicide and I imagine her family must have been like, What happened? Especially mm-hmm. like at her mom's party i mean the holidays it's like talk about even though you hear a lot of people getting depressed and doing things like this in the holidays i'm imagining yeah. at, at least initially that her family had no clue as to why she would have done this no no and of course the newspaper the, her obituary was on the front page of the of the local newspaper wow. but it said nothing about suicide oh, there was no? no hint no no because this is 1948 she's a prominent citizen (laughs) it didn't even mention that she was divorced (laughs) so what did she supposedly die of suddenly i guess i didn't say it didn't say it just said that it uh, it just said she died (laughs) wow okay she just passed away and and it meant and it said that she had lived in monofell all all her life which wasn't true (laughs) she because she had lived in texas and she had lived in memphis for okay. several years, but the but the the newspaper obituary um, just said that she 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 passed away. She had lived in Monticello all of her life. She was much loved by family and friends. Right, uh, and and that was pretty much it. Except the most obvious, which is what everybody was asking, like what happened? <laughs> because she was relatively yeah. a young woman everybody, as far as get dying, you know. So everybody knew she killed herself. I mean, the death certificate says suicide. So yeah, mercury cyanide poisoning. And, right. And so the doctor knew, and the doctor didn't lie about it. Uh, so so word was around. I've talked to elderly people who said, "Oh yeah, yeah, everybody knew she killed herself." I mean, that, but nobody knew why. I'm, I take there was it. never a, nobody. There was never an official statement that she killed herself, or a public official statement. At right. Least. But but everybody knew she killed herself. Nobody knew why though. Okay, that's that's the thing that I'm thinking that, you know, and 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 also of course, the reason why she hid those letters, mm-hmm. because. It was, and it's almost like, yeah, I'm going to kill myself and I'm despondent. But at the same time, I don't want my family to know about this affair I had with a married man. Right. Wow. But you could have destroyed the letters too. Yeah. There were four working fireplaces in the house yes. that December, and it was a cold December. And so it would have been easy enough. She had a fireplace in a room. It would, it would have been right. easy enough for her to retrieve the letters from under the floor in the attic and and slip downstairs to her room and toss them in the fire. But she didn't. I think she, you know, I, and it's not like she killed herself from the spur of the moment. She planned it out. Right, exactly. That's what I was so thinking. So I think she left, I think she deliberately left the letters. I, I think she wanted somebody someday to know who she really was and what was and what truly happened. important to her. Yeah. So, and then how much, how long or after that did her family live there? Because they imagine those. Well, her, her mother, her mother passed away in 1954. Okay. And her, and her older sister passed away in 1955. And that wow. was, that was the end of the line. 
the house was inherited by her older sister's only son, Carl Leidinger Jr., who's a physician in Springfield, Missouri. He hired a property manager and turned the house into apartments. Because I was about to ask you, was was this around the time also that it was divvied up and made into apartments? Yeah, and that's when this ghost story started because the tenants started okay. leaving quickly. <laughs> you know? Okay, there you go. Right, exactly. That's yeah, interesting. So there are all these stories about people, you know, moving in and, and then not staying very long. And the property manager had a hard time renting rooms and keeping tenants because people would get scared by one thing or another. There's a, a novel, a gothic romance novel that was published in 1966 by Carolyn Wilson. And Carolyn Wilson lived in the house oh, in the wow. late 50s when she was a newlywed. And her experience living in the house inspired this 1966 Gothic romance novel. I met Carolyn um, a few months before she passed away, and she she said that the whole time she lived in the house as, as a newlywed, she she felt watched a lot, and she what? felt that somebody resented her. And it was that sense of being watched and, and, a, and that sense of being resented that really made her want to write this kind of creepy gothic romance novel set in a house that's obviously modeled on the Allen house. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Now, and I guess, I mean, how long was it, uh, was it apartments for? Was that for a few years or what? It was apartments for 30 years. That's a pretty long time. That's a lot of people coming um, and going. The mid 1980s until Carl Leidinger passed away. Okay. And his widow decided that it was time to sell that house. <laughs> and, you know, okay. He had promised his grandmother, Caddy, that he would keep the house in the Allen family. So it was actually in the Allen family for 80 years until 1986. Okay. Because I'm thinking to myself, um, okay, you understand. I mean, Liddell is being the ghost, absolutely, and then her family's been there. Did you ever find out if during those 30 years there had been other deaths there? Um, in the house? And I know sometimes um, it's difficult to, to do that, yeah. especially from renters. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of, of any other deaths in the house. Now, the funerals were all in the house. Liddell's funeral was at the house. Wow. Her son's funeral was at the house before hers. Her wow. mother's funeral was in, at the house in 1954, and her sister's funeral was at the house in 1955. They had the funerals in the dining room. <laughs> you know what? We forget about that, <laughs> that people used to be born and die and have their funerals at home. It's not like mm-hmm. it is now. Yeah, when Jolie Allen died in 1917, his banker friends went to Collins where he'd had a heart attack and brought his body back to the house and carried him in and put him on the dining room table. Oh, my God. (laughs) And it's like, yeah, we become so, like, if something like that happened nowadays, we'd be like, huh? Yeah. But because And the, the reason why I'm asking is, like, you said all these EVPs that you hear, you've caught children's voices and all these other distinct voices. And I was thinking, I wonder if any of these were from any of the people that lived there afterwards during those years. Well, no, not afterward. I mean, the, the voices, again, you have Liddell, you got her father. Okay. Her, you've got Alan Bonner, her son. The children's voices probably come from an earlier time. The mm-hmm. original building on the property was a, a boarding school. It was? Oh. 1857. It was a girls boarding school um it was converted into a hospital during the civil war oh no and then after the civil war it was converted back into a boarding school and and then it became a co-educational school the allens had a school ran used the building as a school in the early 20th century so for a good 50 to 60 years at least you you had a school on the property. You know what? Was, I don't know why. In most why. of those years, it was a boarding school. You know what? I, I just thought, I don't know where I got the idea that they were like the first family. You know, in other words, that the occupancy was from only Liddell's family. But God, with that history, no wonder. Yeah, you got the, you got the school, and, and it was on the back of the property, and the house was built in 1906 in front of the school wow no oh yeah oh absolutely yes 
yeah that makes a lot of sense as far as the children's voices and well, there's a tomb. There was a when when we bought the property, I went out to the carriage house and I found a tombstone, a child's tombstone in the wall of the carriage house. Oh my God! So, oh. Um, uh, Houston Meredith, born in 1895 and died in 1900. Oh my! Gee, that's talk about creepy. <laughs> yes, really. I mean, makes you wonder. You have got some burials there on your grounds that you don't know about. Yeah, so it's a tombstone that predates the construction of the house, the main house. Yeah, that um, is, wow, there's a lot of, God knows, you know, and, and that's the thing. Sometimes things got recorded, but a lot of times events like that earlier as you go back, it's kind of sketchy. Just like what you just described when her obituary, it mm -hmm. was printed, but they omit the kind of the centerpiece of the whole thing was what happened to her. Right, yeah. Why well, you don't talk about these things? Right, not exactly. Not 1948. Not in a small town in the south. Yeah. Just it's like, like Liddell is fascinated with astrology. And she wrote to Prentice about his astrological sign and his horoscope all the time. You know, and he just kind of went along with it. You could tell. He didn't well, take it you know, to him back, especially <laughs> if this guy's a, what was he? He was a businessman. He's like. Yeah. Like, okay, whatever. He was not a happen, literary okay. fellow or into yeah. paranormal yeah, like, or the arts or anything like that. But, um, and how long, how long, when did he die? He died in 1978. So he lived quite a few years after she'd passed away. 30 years, yeah. He lived another 30 years. Wow. You know what, and I imagine you can't be, He. he I, I imagine he. he had to have known that this was probably due to what happened between or didn't happen between them as to why she committed suicide. Did he ever find out? I imagine somebody considering that her, one of her confidants was, mm -hmm. was tied to him by family led on. Like, did you hear what happened to Liddell? Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, until I found those letters, I mean, nobody, I, I had never, no, nobody had ever su suggested that she had had an affair in 1948. And right. The, the reason for a suicide. But as I said there earlier, there are all these different theories. The, mm -hmm. the one that came closest was the about the soldier boyfriend who left her in 1945. And Mark, well, after you found those letters, did anything change as far as what you were experiencing in the house? Did it quiet down? Did it become amplified? No, everybody always asks that, and and no, um, I Liddell's still there. <laughs> I mean, okay. everybody's still there. Uh, I think Liddell just wanted her story told. Okay, something interesting um, right. that my wife and I discovered the day after I found the letters. We were doing some research on the internet to find out everything that we could about all the different people mentioned in the letters, mm -hmm. and the name Martha Jones came up on the internet. Martha was Liddell's niece, the right. one that I was very close with. Um, Liddell would go out to see her every month, or, or Martha would come down to Monticello and see Aunt Liddell. Martha was the, the one person still alive in 2009 who had had any kind of relationship with Liddell who okay. remembered Liddell, and Martha had just died that week. Martha had just, so, did you say Martha had just died? Yeah, she just died that week. The, oh. She died like two days before I found the letters. Oh my God, Mark, you can't think that that's a coincidence. No, I think, I think it explains the timing. Yes, of course. Martha was gone, she was the last person who remembered Liddell. Um, there was no one left. Yeah. It was time. That and I woke is... up that Saturday morning and I was led to those letters. Right, because according to what you're saying, you had already been living there a couple of years. So mm -hmm. that timing absolutely had, there was a specific meaning as to why you felt that irresistible urge at that point in time to yeah. go up there and go exploring. Yeah, and, and I knew the day I found the letters, 
I knew, uh, okay, well, I'm going to have to write a book now. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean it wasn't like the first book I'd written. I'd written several books. I won the Faulkner Award for Fiction back in 96. I uh, won other national awards for for um, fiction, but I knew that I was going to have to write a write a book now that I found those letters, and it was not going to be fiction. <laughs> well, no, I was thinking, yeah, this is not fiction. and I mean, and it's not even like, this is like letters. This is... What what straight from the horse's mouth? In other words, as to yeah. the whole exchange of even though it was what a few months only or what a year, whatever that it's like how these things started and wow, and yeah. it explains a lot as far as and so after all of this, you've what you just she you all coexist. She, everything is good in the house. Yeah, yeah, we've never been frightened by anything. Okay. It's just awe-inspiring. Everyone, you know, and we don't wait for things to happen. We don't look for right. things to happen. Um, every once in a while, something will happen, though, and we'll be reminded that we're not alone. Okay. Um, some of the, sometimes, you know, things you know, are a little startling, but um, nothing, nothing scary. We we certainly don't feel there's any animosity. Well, considering what happened. That time that you that first investigation, that a tree fell down. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, yeah I, I think you guys are good there because it's like obviously if if they had a problem with 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 your family being there, so, you know something would have happened, something drastic like I don't know yeah. what. So yeah, I um I I have a guy who comes over to the house and does work for me every once in a while. He's a he's a carpenter mm-hmm. and he he recreates some of the architectural details of the house okay. when when things fall apart and and he um a couple of times now in over the last several years he's he's had to get up in high or high places in the house to do mm-hmm. some work and he's had some close calls and he has told me that he felt somebody pull him back on both occasions. Wow. He he's, he said, I always like working at your house because you always got somebody who saves me. <laughs> That's a neat story. It's almost like, yeah, like it's like, okay, you're good. You're here. You're taking, you're, you're helping the family and you're taking care of the house. So it's all good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is, what a great story. Well, Mark, thank you so very much for sharing that story. <laughs> Everything, it's it's incredible. My pleasure. Especially when you come from the point of what you were talking about where you were a total disbeliever. All you really was this house, you wanted the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you were being the skeptic right up to the last moment. And then, uh, like if that wasn't enough, you find those letters. That's yeah. incredible. What a story. Well, you know what? Uh, well, Liddell, she's got good company, I guess. She's happy there. Yeah. And uh, that's what the one thing that you hope that, you know, a person like that, because she sounds like she readily went through a lot of unhappy moments or mm-hmm. or events in her life, that uh, she's at peace now. And Yeah, and I, and I think that she's, I, I, I like to think that I've done justice in my portrayal of her and mm-hmm. my books in, in the nonfiction A Haunted Love Story and also in the novel um, Ghost Walking which is, is, is fiction, but it has a lot of history and a lot of facts in it. And it's told from Liddell's perspective. She's a ghost. And she's reflecting on what might be the purpose of her death and what maybe was the purpose of her life. Exactly. And, and I'd like to, to think that I've you know, portrayed her as the, the likable, intelligent, very complex, and very identifiable human being that she was I, I think there's something really universal about her in a way because she had this this public life this this facade that she put on that was you know respectable in the eyes of society sure. and then she had this private life yeah and and it was the private life and the components of it that were most important to her Sure. And then, yeah, and people don't realize, like you said, this was back in the 1940s and, you know, her family and everything, certain conduct was expected and the last thing mm-hmm. you wanted was scandal. And um, I imagine even then, if she, even if, let's say, he would have divorced and married her, that still would have been scandalous. Um, yeah, it, it was bad enough that she was a divorcee. She, she even referred to being subjected to what she called the acid test. 
She felt oh. that people were always dipping her in acid, all yeah. because she was divorced. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? A lot of people don't realize that back in those years, yeah, a divorce was like, yeah, you you kind of, especially as a woman, it, it, yeah. it followed you what around, in wrong? other words. It wasn't easily forgotten or overlooked or things like that. She couldn't keep her man. Yeah, you know, I mean, no, you know, he, yeah, he was a womanizer and a drinker, and he couldn't keep a job, but it was her fault. <laughs> right, and it's and, and people don't realize that back then the norms, um, especially if you came from a family had some type of reputation in a smaller town, it was like, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, we're so, so far removed sometimes from what was expected of, you know, people's conduct. That oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, she but she was willing. You know, God knows when you want to be happy, you want to be happy. But, and you know what I'm thinking, Mark? She probably, when you moved in, she rubbed her hands together. She goes, I've got a writer. Great. Mm -hmm. I love this. Okay. (laughs) So, yeah, I'm sure she was like trying to push this, the prior owner out the door. Like, get your stuff and go. Get your (laughs) stuff and go. I got to get, get this writer in here quick. Yeah. Okay, Mark, thank you again so much. It has been absolutely wonderful to talk to you and to listen to Liddell's story. And um, it's been fantastic. It has been it's absolutely been fantastic. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Oh, wow, guys. I don't know about you, but, man, that story is, and it's true. I mean, we see this sometimes on a movie, and we're like, wow, it's really nice and sweet. And I'm going to tell you something. For all those non-believers, even though I know a lot, I got a lot of true believers out there. You know what? But if, like I said, when you're involved with this work, unless you've had personal experiences, but you always have that doubt, like how much of this is real, especially with a lot of the reality TV shows that they make things over the top that after a while, it's good entertainment, but it's like, yeah, okay, how real is this? And um, when you hear this story, which I had heard about from before, because it's it's been featured on other paranormal shows. You ask yourself, um, that it that it is absolutely true, okay. As far as people have questions about what happens to us after we're dead, um, would Liddell's spirit still be there? She hadn't committed suicide. Is this? she's there now because she wants to be was but was she there initially because she was so unhappy that she killed herself uh she says she sounds like despite coming from an affluent background and uh from a good family she sounds like like i told him she didn't sound like she was lucky in love she lost a child she had lost a sister in the same year and maybe this Maybe she was hoping that this um, affair that was she was hoping was going to turn into a marriage was maybe this was her last chance at being happy of having her own home of like, okay, I've got the rest of my life. I want to be happy with somebody. And maybe she thought, you know what? I'm willing to risk the scandal that I know is going to come from me having caused a divorce because like i said back then you know you could basically name somebody a defendant as the person that was basically bringing in the divorce or the this you know the end of the marriage and it was a big scandal if you were nobody who cares but when you had a little, some standing and your family was known and both of their families were known yeah and she's probably thinking here i'm willing like she said she had already been tested you know in other words, she's thinking, okay, I know how bad it can be when you get divorced, even though it's not your fault, and you still get it. So I know that after this, I'm really going to be the other woman, even if I am married to him. And she was probably thinking, I was willing to do all of this, but you had this, we had these wonderful moments together, and maybe you were really sincere when you promised that you were like, that's it, I haven't been happy with my wife, I'm going to get a divorce. But when we're all was said and done, you were not willing to do what I was willing to do to be together with you. In other words, I would be willing to sacrifice, but you wouldn't. So in other words, you loved me, but up to a certain point. 
let me tell you that's got to be really disappointing and um yeah yeah and uh it makes you think that you know like i said maybe she really thought at some point that this was going to be her last chance at happiness you know maybe she thought okay if this doesn't work out i just don't want to figure out you know what else is in store for me even though it was premeditated you know makes you wonder what would have happened if she would have like held out for a little bit longer or or let's face it maybe a part of her maybe she saw something where she goes you know what this this man that i thought was going to marry me at this point all i all I, I can tell that if i have any type of relationship with him it's going to be as his mistress and let's face it that probably wasn't acceptable to her she says i'm i'm not what i'm i'm not going to be the mistress i'm not going to be sneaking around meeting you on business trips or in these places and and then eventually at some point you're still going to be married and one day you'll say that's it i've had enough of this and what then i'll really you know if anybody ever found out about it and you know what hats off to her confidence because they did keep her confidence that was that was that that was outstanding those were good friends and um even though maybe amongst her family they spoke about it as to what had happened and uh i'm not kidding i i don't think it's coincidental that mark and his family and that he's a writer and that right after her niece dies is when he is driven to look in there and find those letters i don't think that it was and by the way this thing of having a tree fall and disconnect electricity let me tell you something that's pretty scary scary in the sense of nothing happened to them but scary in the sense of god that's a lot of manipulation of of power of of because like he said there's no storm there was nothing to to explain why would a tree come crashing down and and do exactly what needed to be done something that absolutely was going to stop that investigation right then and there which was no electricity come on nothing's impossible but what are the what are the odds on that like i say paranormal sabotage yes for those that 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 says a lot. But anyway, guys, I hope you like the show. I've got a f lot of fantastic guests coming on. A lot of fantastic shows. I've got some storytelling shows. I've got interviews. I might have some field investigations since they pop up. I'm super busy. Uh, a lot of people have asked me to do live streams on YouTube, especially having to do with hypnosis, alternative areas of hypnosis as far as when it comes to past life regressions also recovering <clears throat> memories from alien abductions a um, bunch of stuff i'm going to do shows about that and my true believers go to miamighostchronicles.com go to the submit your story tab and let me hear your story catch me facebook twitter instagram i live stream i try to live stream i've been really busy like when stuff like like what i told you about <laughs> the power goes out there's an outage on what three days ago in my area and it's out for like four or five hours i don't know what happened and i live like i said i live in a hundred year old farmhouse and we get water from a well that's on the property and guess what you know it comes in it's pump no in other words it's not when you have your water connected to county or city where it doesn't matter if the electricity goes out you're still gonna have water surprise <laughs> when that power came back on and turned the faucet no water and we ended up having to do a new well just because we couldn't figure out that was another thing we couldn't find where the old well was we had another well on the property <clears throat> which was used at once upon a time for some type of orchard and stuff but where we thought the old original well was because let's face it when you go looking for a well <laughs> it wasn't we couldn't find it i was like okay so where's this well uh, so we ended up getting a new well. So anyway, the point being that sometimes life gets in the way of your best laid plans. So 
guys, thank you again so very, very much. If you're catching me on YouTube or on podcast forms, which of course we're on, you can find me on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. I'm there. Uh, thank you again and uh, for spending this time with me. And if you have any suggestions for shows or material or people that you would like to have on the show, please uh, send me an email. Send me an email at marlene at Take care, guys.